to, in essence, say, okay, you know, we have this antitrust exemption. We have this lawsuit that occurred um, where, in essence, the Supreme Court said baseball is not subject to the Sherman Antitrust Act. And you had football, basketball, and hockey said, so well, in essence, basically, we want the same thing. It's the same sort of deal. One sport's playing football, the other one's playing baseball. It's the same kind of concept. I mean, nothing else is different. We want the same deal. So we saw how the NFL had essentially used it initially to begin with players, restricting players with the Roselle rule and things like that. And uh, the players, in essence, fought back and they, they said, no, I don't want this stuff. Right. We also saw how they had used it in terms of broadcasting. So that the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL basically have the uh, right to form a trust when it comes to negotiating broadcasting rights. Uh, so what we want to see is we want to see how this played out for baseball. So the early 1950s, we have a guy by the name of George Toulson. He's a member of the New York Yankees. He sues uh, to avoid being sent back to the minor leagues. And he does so under the basis that the reserve clause is in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So as his suit is working its way through the system, you have the House subcommittee. On the study of monopoly power, Uh, they're having meetings, right? So they're holding hearings. They're having meetings. They're collecting data. Right? And this is run by a guy by the name of Emanuel Seller. It's called the Seller Committee. And like I said, they're holding hearings on baseball's antitrust exemption. Basically trying to see, basically trying to wrap their arms around the problem. When it becomes obvious that the Toulson case here is going to the Supreme Court, this committee stops working thinking, well, if it's going to go to SCOTUS, we'll let, go to, we'll let it go to SCOTUS. We'll see what SCOTUS says. I mean, maybe, in essence, they'll rule that uh, baseball's not um, subject to Sherman Antitrust, or maybe they rule that they are in violation of Sherman Antitrust. Uh, in essence, it'll save us a lot of work, right? So this Toulson case is going to SCOTUS. The seller committee stops working. thinking that the Supreme Court is going to take care of it. The Supreme Court looks and says, hey, the seller committee quit working on this. It must not be that important. We're not going to take the case anymore. All right? So they think the case is going to SCOTUS. The seller committee stops working on it. SCOTUS says, well, seller committee quit working. <coughs> A 
they don't accept the case. And in other words, the Supreme Court says, well, Congress must actually approve of our ruling. Remember, the Supreme Court hates to overturn itself. Nineteen sixty eight. A guy by the name of Kurt Flood. He has a good season with the Cardinals. He asks for a thirty thousand dollar raise. The Cardinals trade him to the Phillies. Okay. So in 1967, Cardinals had won the World Series and they came within one game of winning it in 1968, right? I mean, so he's somewhat justified in his uh, request for this race, basically saying, I'm a good player. The Phillies are losing all of the time. Why go from a team that's winning the World Series to a team that's losing the World Series? I mean, not losing the World Series. I mean, not even getting winning seasons. In addition to this, the Philadelphia Phillies don't have a very good reputation with black players. Nineteen seventy. Kurt Flood sues. All right, he asks for three million dollars in damages. Lower court and appeals court rule against him. The Supreme Court, when this thing goes to the Supreme Court, states that baseball is a business. Engaged in interstate commerce. All right, remember what the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution says. You cannot have a trust for interstate commerce. The interstate commerce is regulated by the federal courts, by the federal government. In-state commerce, intra-state com uh, commerce is regulated by the states. Right? So they're saying, remember what the uh, federal decision said. The federal decision said baseball is not a business, it's an exhibition, and it's not interstate commerce. There's no interstate commerce that's occurring here, despite the fact that you have teams in different states playing each other. Right? Supreme Court says baseball is a business. It's engaged in interstate commerce. You would think they would say, therefore, what? Therefore, they're subject to antitrust. They're subject to Sherman. That's not what they say. They say baseball is a business engaged in interstate commerce. The federal court got that wrong, in, or the federal decision in 1922 was wrong. They should not have said baseball is an entertainment. It's not a business. It's not engaged in interstate commerce. It's clearly engaged in interstate commerce. We don't understand why the federal ruling is the way that it is.
but we don't want to overturn ourselves. So we're going to let it stand. So in essence, they rule against flood. 1974. This is the power of precedent. They all know it's bad law. They will not overturn themselves. And it's not even them doing it. It's a whole bunch of people from a long time ago. Those people are all dead. Nineteen seventy four. Arbitrator Pete Seitz. Decides that James Catfish Hunter is a free agent. What had happened is that Mr. Hunter had said the Oakland A's had violated his contract. <coughs> this was a clause concerning retirement contributions. And in essence, the Oakland A's had not fulfilled their contract in terms of how much they were to contribute for retirement. The arbitrator just goes to arbitration. The guy decides, yep, you know what, Oakland A's, you guys screwed up. His contract's null and void. He can go anywhere he wants to go. He signs with the Yankees. Comes the first million dollar player. Remember, this is 1974 when a million dollars actually bought something. Million bucks. When I'm getting $20,000 or whatever, or $30,000 or whatever the number is, floodgates are open. It's done. All right. Reserve clause is gone. We still have, in essence, in baseball, limited contracts for six years. But after the first six years, everyone is, in essence, a free agent and able to sign with whomever they want to sign. In 1998, Congress finally gets around to doing something. Passed the Curt Flood Act. It limits baseball's uh, 
dealings. in the labor market. And basically grants players the right to file lawsuits. Now these players' rights though are limited Another court case, Brown versus Pro Football. This was a ruling <clears throat> that said that the players' unions have to decertify themselves. To sue, right? So you got a union. If you want to sue under anti under antitrust um, cases, you have to decertify the union. Say, okay, we vote to not be a union anymore. Then you can sue. Um, so you can see that it's kind of a high bar to get there, but it is possible. So in essence, what we have here is we have a somewhat partial antitrust exemption for the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL. We have this partial. Antitrust exemption for broadcasting rights. You have, to a degree, a full antitrust exemption in baseball. But it's still somewhat untested in the courts. They still have not basically overturned the federal baseball decision. Right of 1922. It's kind of an untested, it's an it's a untested, limited antitrust exemption. People haven't gotten around to getting uh, to the point where they want to sue about it yet. So for some obvious reasons here, owners were clearly in favor of the reserve clause. It essentially gave them the power to do whatever they wanted to do. We have this huge restriction in player salaries. We think somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent. <coughs> Went to the owner. So the players are literally only getting 10 to 20 percent. Now here's something that I find really, really interesting about this. When I teach American economic history, we talk about slavery for obvious reasons. 
And there's really good evidence that slaves in the American South got about 10% of their value in compensation. All right, and then they just, they would get money, they would get special gifts and things like that from the owners and things like that. So the slaves in the American South are getting about 10% of their value in forms of compensation for themselves. The owners are keeping 90%. And what do we have here in baseball? You got something that looks really similar. I'm generating $100 million worth of value and I'm getting about 10 million, maybe 20. Very, very similar to what you actually had in the American South pre-Civil War, right? So let us look at an example. We've got Willie Mays. His contract, he's basically done uh, with his career right before free agency occurs. He earned about $14 million in today's dollars. Take all of his earnings over the course of his career, bring that all up in today's dollars. He earned about $14 million. The estimate is, is that had he been a free agent, he would have had about $127.7 million in earnings. Ten percent of 127 is 12.7, so he got a little bit more than 10 percent of his earnings. The other thing that the owners would say Well, this is uh, fan integrity. Keeps players honest. <clears throat> and trying their best. How do you see that? Does that even make sense? That doesn't make sense to me at all. And in fact, if you guys watch movies on baseball, there's this one movie called, uh, is it Little League? With the little kid who breaks his arm. His grandpa owns the Minnesota Twins. I think it was the Minnesota Twins. I can't remember. There's a whole bunch. Of, there's two or three of them like that. He becomes the owner because the grandpa dies. The money all goes, the whole team goes to him. So he's owning it and managing it. And of course, the adult players are like, this sucks. I mean, you're a little kid. What do you know? And one of the pitchers keeps throwing, you know, he keeps throwing it such that the other person just keeps hitting the ball, hitting the ball, hitting the ball. All right? He's putting the game farther and farther behind. And the kid says, what are you doing? You're supposed to be throwing strikes. You know, get this guy out. And, and he says, uh, look, I'm, I'm eligible for the draft here in X number of games. Next season, I'm done. You know, I'm not going to play for a little kid. You know, what are you going to do about it? And he says, I'm going to play you. And if you keep doing that, when it comes time for you to go as a free agent and you can't get anybody out, what do you think happens to the value of your, of your contract? I mean, how, how, who's going to want you, basically, if you can't strike anybody out? Of course, in the next scene cuts to the guys doing strike, 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 getting people out, right? Their idea here is that, well, by not being able to be traded, you'll keep players honest. If you could actually play for this future team, maybe you wouldn't play as hard against them. That doesn't even make any sense, right? But that's what they said. This keeps players honest. It keeps players trying their best. The other thing that they said was that this helps to maintain 
competitive balance. Right? We've got this player. He can't go to any other teams. Therefore, we're going to continue to have competitive balance. This is going to keep the rich teams from buying up all of the talent. But this goes against the invariance principle. And clearly, talent moved between team to team. The invariance principle says it doesn't matter whether the good player, <coughs> the good players are going to go to the rich teams, the bad players are going to go to the poor teams. Invariant of who gets the money, the owners or the player. It doesn't matter. That's what the invariance principle says. All right? So if you have a player here that's playing for the Kansas City Royals and the New York Yankees, right? And we're paying him, I'm making up a number here, you're paying him $10 million. He's generating his marginal revenue product of $10 million in Kansas City. And if he was in New York, he would generate $50 million marginal revenue product. It doesn't matter who's getting the money, the player or the owner. The guy is eventually going to go from the Kansas City Royals to the New York Yankees. If he's the one getting the money, it's obvious what's going to happen, right? He's playing in Kansas City for $10 million. That's his contract for, for four years. He's got a $10 million four-year contract, $2.5 million per year. If he goes to the Yankees, what, 12.5? 12.5 million per year, right? So when he comes up, he's going to say, I want to, go to the, I want to go to the Yankees. So the guy goes to the Yankees. <coughs> if the owners are getting the money, how is it that the guy would still wind up at the Yankees? Exactly. The owner can say, here's what you're making in Kansas City. You're making, I'm making up a number. You're making up a million dollars. Hey, New York, hey, Kansas City Royals owner, I'll pay you $25 million for the guy. Would the Kansas City Royals take that deal? Heck yeah, he's only generating $10 million in revenue in Kansas City, but if I sell him to the Yankees, I can get $25 million. I'm clearly $15 million better off. I'll sell him for any price above $10 million. The Yankees will pay any price less than $50 million. We can come up to some agreement. We'll pay $25 million, right? So the New York Yankees can say, okay, we'll give you $25 million for that $10 million player. They bring him to New York. They paid $25 million for him. He's earning $50 million for the team. The New York Yankees are up $25 million. The Kansas City Royals are up $15 million. Everyone's happy. All right? And what this dollar amount is depends upon the relative bargaining power and how much they think the player is worth. It'll be somewhere between 50 million and 10 million. But the player doesn't get that money. The owners get that money. The owners have an incentive to sell off the good talent to the rich teams. So the invariance principle says, look, it doesn't matter who gets the money, whether it's the players or the owners. Willie Mays is going to go to the team he should be at. Derek Jeter is going to go to the team he should be at. Babe Ruth is going to go to the team he should be at. Doesn't matter whether the players get the money or the owners get the money. It's invariant. If there's money to be made, 25 million here, 15 million here, the money will be the money will take place.
So, I think there is clearly a case that professional athletes are underpaid. Despite the fact that everyone's talking about how much money they make, I think there's really good evidence that they're actually underpaid. One of the ways that the players can get around this, of course, is to form a union. And we come back to this thing where under competitive markets, just good old-fashioned supply and demand, right? If the supply of something is really large, there's a whole bunch of people supplying it, the demand, there's a whole bunch of different people demanding it. You don't, you don't really need a union. You'll get to this Q1P1 on your own. I mean, you really will. If Missouri State as an employer sucks, and there's other employers in the area that are also universities that could do the same thing, people will leave. They'll go to the other universities. Or McDonald's, or retail, or manufacturing or whatever. The problem is, of course, that in some markets you have monopolies, right? These are single sellers. And monopsonies single buyers. You don't have perfect competition on either the supply side or the demand side. You're going to have you're going to have some problems. So let's look at these two different types of unions <coughs> that can exist. We have craft unions. Members are from a specific craft. So these would be things like carpenters, truck drivers, electrical workers, etc. In the early 20th century, they formed the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. You have industrial unions they represent workers in a particular industry so here you have things like auto workers UAW you got the steel workers etc they formed the congress of industrial organization CIO. Okay. So both of these unions kind of seek the same thing. They want basically higher wages for their workers. But they come about it in different ways. So our craft unions they seek to limit access. So here's our quantity of labor. Here's our wage. We have some demand 
Remember, here's our marginal product of labor. We have some supply, non-union. Right, this would be QL, and we would have some wage here, say, uh, I'll just call it WL. All right. But what they say is that we want laws that say you can only hire, basically, union workers. And so that quantity, here's your supply of union workers. Right, where here you're going to have some wage rate, WU. Okay. So you have some wage rate here, WU, but there's a whole bunch of other people that are willing to do the work that are not in the union for significantly less. So rather than hiring this quantity of labor, QL, you have some other quantity, I'll call it QU, and you have a deadweight loss here that's equal to this triangle area in here. One of my students in this class several years ago, he was a carpenter and he actually worked on the Kauffman Stadium renovations that they had. So that was his job, he was a carpenter. Uh, interestingly enough, and he was saying that his wrists were completely shot from hammering in. And it's like, hammering in? What? Nobody does that anymore. Everybody uses nail guns now. Why would you not use a nail gun? And he said, well, the union rules are that we don't use nail guns because nail guns go faster and take fewer people. And you guys know what a nail gun is, right? You just do, 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 as opposed to boom, 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 next nail, boom, 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 right? And so the rules are that we can't use nail guns so that there's more people that you have to hire, and that's more people paying in union dues. And my wrists are shot because we've been doing it this way for X number of years. Like, that doesn't make any sense. That's completely stupid. And I said, yeah, I know but that's the way that it is. So the craft union's job is to limit access. Not necessarily just only to union labor. Could be things like you can't use things like nail guns. You can't use, you know, you have to dig the trench to lay pipe by hand. You can't use a backhoe. I mean, stupid stuff like that. Basically to create work for people. Yeah. That's, and that's what he said. And when he was complaining about it, he said, my wrists are shot. And I said, oh, sorry, I guess you're on disability. And he said, no, the union won't support me on that because the union boss plays with this other guy golf and they're just not, they're throwing me to the wolves. I got to pay for all of the, so he would have like operations on his wrists, didn't wait six weeks, have the other operation on his wrist. I felt sorry for the guy. I mean, it really did. He was like, the, the union screwed him. And like, like you said, not all are necessarily that way. But that one was. That's just what they did to the guy. The other way is the industrial union. tries to increase wages via collective bargain. All right, through the threat of strikes. So once again, we've got our quantity of labor here. We have our wage, we have our demand. Here's our marginal revenue product, we have our supply. 
right? And rather than some wage being here, I'll just call it, say, WL, and hiring a QL amount of workers, you just have some wage rate up here, WU, QU, and once again, you have some dead weight loss. All right. So the result here is the same for both of these. You've got this dead weight loss because there's a difference between the wage that people are getting and the wage that people are actually willing to do the work at. And the quantity of labor is not at the competitive rate QL. So what we have here is when we have unions, you've got, in essence, a single seller. And there's also a single buyer. Because remember, if you want to pay, if you want to play professional football, there really is only one buyer, the NFL. There's not 32 buyers, there's one buyer. We'll look at this problem of the bilateral monopoly on Wednesday.